Welcome back. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I'm the president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. I'm talking to you from the basement of the Richard Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California. Behind me in our studio is a picture of President Nixon's <coughs> birthplace, which you can visit when you come to Yorba Linda, and I hope that you will. With me is Jeff Shepard, and if you have not, you ought to listen to the first eight parts of this series that we have done on Watergate, how it happened from the perspective of a lawyer on President Nixon's team inside the White House. President Nixon resigned on August 9, 1974, moved to San Clemente and continued on with his defense and what became ultimately a stellar post-presidential career as a public servant and an advisor to uh, future presidents and world leaders and a writer of extraordinary ability and accomplishment until his death. And he is, of course, buried here along with Mrs. Nixon. But that didn't end the Watergate prosecutions. And I asked Jeff if he wouldn't do an epilogue on what happened to the other players in Watergate after President Nixon resigned and was pardoned by Gerald Ford. Uh, thank you, Hugh. And Nixon resigns on the 9th. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the memos within the Watergate prosecution staff uh, are, are uh, what, what should we do? I mean, the guys resigned, and there are probably 15 memos, all of which say, well, we indict him. The only issue is, does that postpone the other indictments? And there, there's no arguments about, about, you know, he suffered enough or he's gone or anything like that. It's, it's uh, we got, we're going to put this guy in jail. Uh, and then suddenly Ford, one month after Nixon resigns, Ford pardons him. Now, I believe Ford thought Nixon would die if he weren't pardoned. I have to think it's true. Nixon was very, very sick. Uh, uh, the, the, they were in full throat, the prosecutors. Uh, they wanted to bag their man, and they, you know, he, he, he no longer president, but they weren't through. Uh, and then they decide, Jaworski says, well, check out the pardon. And he gets this memo, most bizarre memo you've ever seen in your life, where they say, well, we don't think the pardon was valid. And he says, well, why don't you think the pardon was valid? And the argument is, Who well, writes this memo? Uh, a staff member for Phil Lacavara, but Phil forwards it to Jaworski with his endorsement. Okay, it's a very, very embarrassing memo. I have it. It says roughly, uh, uh, Elliot Richardson agreed he would not fire the special prosecutor except for special circumstances. Uh, uh, Nixon agreed to that because Elliot's his attorney general, so we imply that to Nixon. Ford has become president, and we think Nixon's obligation carries over to Ford, and by pardoning Nixon, he has interfered with a special prosecutor. Therefore, the pardon is improper. And Jaworski says, in his writing, I have it, to his deputy, I would be embarrassed to raise this argument in court. Of course he would be. Of it's course he would be. It's just, argument. But it shows you the venom. incredible bias and venom uh, uh, within the special prosecution force. Then uh, Nixon's at home. Uh, seven people have been indicted for the, uh, the cover-up. Chuck Colson has pled to the Plumbers case, so he's out of it. Uh, uh, and the trial goes forward. Uh, John Dean has testified in an unrelated case in New York uh, called the Vesco case. Uh, and Vesco is acquitted and includes Maury Stans and John Mitchell. Uh, uh, he gave $200,000, and the issue was were they trying to get the SEC to stop an investigation? John Dean's one of the lead government witnesses. He's acquit uh, the, they're all acquitted. And one of the jurors says to the press, well, we didn't believe John Dean. So Judge Sirica calls John Dean in and sentences him to one to four years in prison uh, with his incarceration to start on the first day of the cover-up trial. So he will be a better witness. Uh, uh, and he's the opening uh, uh, witness. And the prosecutors in their later books say, boy, this showed how astute this was. If he walked scot-free, it would not help our case. But by him having a severe prison sentence, he could testify from prison. I was a part of a cover-up. These people were in it. I've been punished. You should, you should punish them. And they did. They convicted them on all counts. When? Uh, uh, July, uh, excuse me, January 1st, 1975. It's a three-month trial. Was it still, because people won't remember, I don't remember, I'm, I'm a freshman in college. I have no recollection of this trial at all. I know that people went to jail. Was it intensively covered with anything like the interest that had accompanied the Nixon pursuit, impeachment, prosecution? 
Well, no, because you can't film a federal trial. So you had reports, but trials are dull if you aren't, if you aren't careful. Three months of presenting a very complicated conspiracy. There was no proof. They, the, uh, the, the indictment names 45 overt acts, okay, of criminal nature that showed there was a cover-up. But most of them were done by the 19 unindicted co-conspirators. The involvement of Bob Haldeman was three or four of these. The involvement of John Ehrlichman was three or four of these. So what they're saying is, well, we're going to bring everybody in. We're telling you everybody was, was uh, uh, guilty as they could be. There are five different defense tables in the courtroom. I have a sketch of what that courtroom looked like. The special prosecutor has six seats. Then there are five different tables from five different defendants. They put somebody on the stand, and somebody is testifying about when they changed the sheets in July. The jury can't follow it. Uh, uh, the, the guy who wrote the, uh, the, the principal treatise on conspiracy at that time is a professor at William & Mary, Paul Marcus. And he says, you know, the jury can't follow this stuff. And it comes down to, do they like the defendants? And they didn't like these defendants. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and, and Mitchell are convicted on all counts. And one week after the conclusion of the cover-up trial, Judge Sirica, on his own motion, sets Dean completely free. No probation, no parole. And it turns out the guy who was one to four years in prison served less than four months. And then it turns out he never spent a single night in jail. It was all a fraud. He was put in a witness holding facility at Fort Holliburton, Maryland, and that's where he spent his nights, roughly in army barracks. And during the day, he was driven by federal marshals to a dedicated office on K Street where he worked on his book. And he said in different radio interviews, pretty tough, don't you think? What were the sentences distributed to Halderman, Ehrlichman, and Mitchell? Two and a half to eight years. And how long did each of them serve? Roughly 18 months, different places, uh, 18 months each. Uh, uh, they, 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 they were uh, ruined, of course, for the, for the rest of their lives. Actually, Mitchell <laughs> came back and had a productive life. Haldeman uh, had, a, had a pretty productive life. I don't believe that John Ehrlichman ever reconciled with the president. No, he didn't. Uh, John uh, learned uh, rather late in the game that uh, he, he didn't know there was a taping system. And when it came down to the last group, Haldeman, Nixon, and Ehrlichman, uh, that was the, the centerpiece of the defense, uh, there was another group inside there that knew that they were being taped and Ehrlichman didn't. And he wanted Nixon to, uh, to be a witness at the, uh, the cover-up trial because Nixon, uh, Ehrlichman maintained he had been for full disclosure all along. He wanted to disclose because he said he was destroying the presidency. He was Dean who was fighting disclosure. And then, we, and then after that, see, that's what we learned. I get access to the special prosecutor's files, and I got some. But what really changed uh, uh, is the Jaworski files that I got for my second book. And then five things have happened since the second book. Vorenberg's handwritten notes have surfaced. He was the self-appointed guy that was going to write their report when they were through. They didn't know they would be successful. So he took notes at every staff meeting, and you can trace the attitudes and what's going on. Uh, uh, that was the, the, they came out after my book. Uh, on October 11th, the roadmap came out, which of truly— Of 2018. Uh, of 2018, which truly changes everything. Uh, the other two, maybe there are only four major developments— President Trump has made two things acceptable. That's the concept of fake news and the concept of the deep state. And if you project back to Watergate, that's what sunk Richard Nixon. That's why Nixon had no defenders at the end. Well, there is a piece by his son-in-law, Ed Cox, and you in the Wall Street Journal not long ago that argued the economy was in the tank when Huge President difference. Nixon was impeached. Yes. And uh, other differences between then and now. Uh, yes. Uh, there were real crimes in Watergate. Yes. The issue was who was involved. There are no crimes with Trump. So the question becomes, had there been a Fox News and had there been a talk radio world mm -hmm. and had there been fairness 
in the prosecution, would Richard Nixon have survived his presence at the end of his second term? Well, I think the easier question is if there had been no taping system or the tapes were not disclosed. That's easy. Uh, yes. That he, he would have finished the presidency. Yes. Based on everything I know, and I have pondered this almost my entire adult life, but based on everything I've learned recently, I think Nixon would have survived. Then I want to challenge, not so much challenges to distinguish. I don't believe that there's a deep state. I believe there are career bureaucrats who are sometimes opposed to the operation of whatever the president is doing. But when you bring back the Kennedy Justice Department, about which we know a lot now because of Harvard Law Professor Jack Goldsmith, and about which the ethics are at best sketchy, you are importing into your administration um, a toxin, uh, uh, an antibody, uh, uh, an yes. opponent, an enemy. Uh, uh, I, I don't think the Founding Fathers ever envisioned employees of the executive branch working hand in glove with the legislative branch to impeach their, their president. So it brings just a legal question. Does Jeff Shepard, do you support the independent counsel statute ever? And do you, what do you make of the institution of special prosecutors? I don't mind as much the institution of special prosecutors who report into and must abide by Department of Justice guidelines. That's much less offensive than the, st the, the Watergate situation where they were freed from that and the independent prosecutor portion of the Ethics in Government Act of 1978 that created independent prosecutors. I think that was unconstitutional. Uh, it was the held Supreme Court disagreed. Well, yes, but it was held to be unconstitutional at the D.C. Circuit uh, level uh, in a brilliant opinion written by Larry Silberman where it describes, he goes into it in great detail, and he says, look, this only comes up in times of divided government. The independent prosecutor is appointed for a specific purpose to get somebody. They got no problems with money, no problems with time, and they're credited with success on whether they get that person. That's not due process. Oh, it's a, it's a nightmare, and I've taught con law for 25 years. I've always been against and it. And then it goes to the Supreme Court. It's reversed 8-0. Uh, eight one Scalia dissent. Scalia dissents. I knew Scalia. I knew Rehnquist. I worked with them when they were head of office of legal counsel. And I ran into Nino uh, uh, shortly after that opinion was handed down. And I went over and I said, you know, pretty disappointed in the Supreme Court decision. And he said, well, Jeff, I dissented. And I really said this. I mean, I, you know, young Nino, we didn't put you on the court for your vote alone. You were supposed to influence the other people. I said it tongue in cheek. Now, you know, later, years later, shortly before he passed away, Nino was asked about what case he was most troubled by in his entire career on the Supreme Court. And he said it's a little known obscure case named Morrison v. Olson, where the Supreme Court was not just wrong, but dead wrong. And, and then later, I think Nino had passed away. The D.C. Circuit in their historical society recreated the argument of Morrison v. Olson, and Larry Silberman was the judge, and Ted Olson got to argue the, the uh, unconstitutionality, and there was somebody else pressed into service to argue the government's position, and she said, now understand I'm only doing this as an obligation. I don't believe in this, this, this part of the, uh, 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 of the argument. It's... Uh, I don't like the due process idea of a prosecutor appointed to get somebody. I think the Patrick Fitzgerald example under Bush There are many two, examples. Lawrence Walsh is another one. A huge example. They but all he's, go wrong. He's independent. Is it? The, 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 he's the independent counsel. So is uh, Ken Starr is the independent counsel. But Fitzgerald was operating under James Comey at the Department of Justice. He finds out in the first three days that the leak of Valerie Plame's name is done by Richard Armistead inadvertently, Armitage. Armitage. Armitage, inadvertently at the Department of State. And he says to Armitage, don't tell anybody. And he continues his investigation with no uh, 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 rationale whatsoever to get Vice President uh, Cheney's Chief of Staff, Scooter, Scooter Libby. Libby, 
And then it turns out that Scooter Libby and Patrick Fitzgerald had crossed swords before, and Scooter Libby was representing a questionable defendant, Mark Rich, and prevailed, and what Fitzgerald may have been doing was evening the score in ruining we, Scooter we Libby. Don't we don't know. But we don't I, know. But I, I want to close by this, Jeff, two, two questions. First, an observation, then a question. You call him, you know, I call him Justice Scalia because he was kind to me when I clerked in the D.C. Circuit. My judge was sick. He gave me a few cases. His dissent is the only dissent that I really pay much attention to in Morrison versus Forster. Because I always tell my law students, dissents are interesting, but if you're going to pass the bar, you better know what the majority is. And, and so I make them pay attention to that because the unitary executive is important. Would you give us just a preview of coming attraction? What is your book going to be about? Well, my book is, is going to use the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Watergate scandal as a reason for a full review of what we know today. And it asks the question, if everything we know today we had known at that time, would Nixon still have been run out of office? Uh, even if there had been a Senate trial, would, he, would two-thirds of the senators have, have voted against him? Uh, the, the revelations will be far more in connection with Richard Nixon. I've, I've written a book, two books, that focused on the lack of due process in the prosecution of, of uh, uh, the Nixon staff members, largely because I was closest to them and I thought they were treated very badly, and I was operating under the misimpression of the smoking gun tape. I, I really thought that Nixon did wrong, that he was involved. I, I, I bought into Fred Bizart's interpretation. And I've now turned and I've focused my investigation and focused my pursuit of evidence with regard to the person of Richard Nixon. And I think that I can lay out, I'm eager to lay out the case that he was personally wronged. Uh, that the prosecutors in secret assured the grand jurors and the House Judiciary Committee staff that Nixon had personally approved the payment of blackmail. The famous five fingers on that Wednesday, that 10 hours, that they assured them that they could prove that Nixon was involved. We didn't know that. I think we could have challenged or refuted that assertion, but it was made in secret. And I think that's what really put Nixon on the ropes. And will you be, for the first time in this book, telling us what Fred Bazart said to the president yes. in that call? Yes, I have made my peace because I now believe that Fred was, was in error in his interpretation of the smoking gun tape. I am much more at ease in detailing Fred's highly unique role in, uh, uh, in his defense of Richard Nixon. And have you written that portion yet? Because I'd like you to put a copy on file here at the library in the event an anvil falls on Jeff Shepard. Um, I have written an outline. Uh, the outline recasts the Watergate story in light of fake news and deep state politics, which you disagree, but I bought into a head and sinker, line and sinker. And it recasts the Watergate situation in those items because I think that's easier to convince the public that what I say is more credible because now we don't no, that, I, I couldn't disagree with we that. We don't automatically accept I would, what the press has said. I would love if you would go out in and, that outline. Well, I'm going to and dictate in, for a future. We won't release it. I just want to make sure I've got it because that's in, an interesting historical note about which I've never heard until this moment. In that outline I have detailed more than I have ever written down elements of Fred's, I call it bizarre soliloquy. Well, write more and send us a copy. <laughs> Jeff Shepard, thank you. This has been fascinating. Is it off? It isn't off. That would be wrong. <laughs> I want you to wrap up. Anything oh, I'm forgotten? sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I asked if it was off because I was going to tell you a couple things from oh, Bizarre. It's but still I'm on. not going to no, tell you. No, don't tell me anything. No, I, don't, I want it to be surprised. <laughs> Is there anything we forgot, missed, et cetera? I, we've covered an awful lot. Uh, I think. Well, I'll give you one more thing, if right. I may. Okay? Remember. A little dessert. A little dessert. Uh, uh, Howard Hunt, fake memo, 
fake cable uh, 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 condoning or approving or being complicit in DM's assassination. Oh, Patrick Gray burns it you in his it. vacation yeah. home. Yeah. Turns out there really was a cable. They really did send a cable to Vietnam uh, that's complicit in DM's uh, assassination. They didn't disclose it. They were hiding it. If your people Google cable 243, uh, up will come a full explanation of that cable. So it's entirely possible that Hunt had been asked to reconstruct a cable he had seen that the Kennedy administration refused to disclose. But in fact, they knew DM was likely to be assassinated, and they said, okay. A interesting. US, a U.S. ally. Interesting, and another known unknown. Thank you, Jeff Shepard. Thank you, Hugh.